Okay. Welcome, the, um, Dr. Jacobson, Dr. Myers, Dr. Sanchez. So it seem like it's a good time to go ahead and start. I will. Okay. The more faces I see, the more interesting it is for me. Oh, there's the faces. <laughs> then I know if I tell a really terrible joke. Um, Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the University of Utah. Uh, this is our second virtual open house. Uh, and uh, we're so excited to see you all uh, virtually. Wish you could be here with us. Um, but I'm Sarah Lenher. I am the program director uh, for the residency program here at the University of Utah. And um, joining me, I have uh, Dr. Myers, uh, who is the chief of urology for the division. He's there. He found a very nice jacket with, a, I'm sure, a special lapel pin um, that maybe he'll tell us about. Um, and then uh, Dr. Jacobson, he's looking to come up with a story. Dr. Jacobson is our associate program director. Uh, looks like she's just finishing up in the OR and um, has had a busy day. Uh, but that's always good. Um, and she's a pediatric urologist and I'll introduce her all a little bit more. And then uh, Dr. Alejandra Sanchez is our is one of our um, urologic oncologists, but he is also our uh, division of urology, equity, diversity and inclusion. So EDI liaison, and he's kind of been tasked with helping us uh, uh, work on our EDI at the Department of Surgery and the Division of Urology. Um, after we kind of go through some things, um, we'll uh, have you meet the chief residents and some of the senior residents, I think, because we had a lot of people sign up and they wanted to distribute you all well enough so you didn't have really large rooms. Um, as we're going along, please uh, use the chat box or wave a hand or something. Dr. Jacobson will be keeping an eye out for things, um, but please let us know uh, if you need us to stop and go over anything in more detail, or if you just want me to speed it up and skip over something. Um, so we're very, very excited to have you join us uh, for our virtual open house. This is the second year uh, that we are doing this, as you all know, uh, and we're very disappointed that you're not able to be here to see beautiful Utah and Salt Lake City, uh, but we know this is a destination. So um, I'm sure many of you all have been here uh, but it is really uh, helpful when we're able to connect with you even more. So we wish you were here. It was a beautiful 80 degree day, sunny, breezy, uh, great for hikes in the mountains. Um, so we'll give a brief overview uh, and hopefully address questions that have come up commonly over the last two years that we've been doing this. Um, and then um, the last thing I wanna say in this introduction is this open house is really for you uh, so we want to make sure we're addressing your needs as we as you go through this application process. Um, so uh, thank you for coming to join us and uh, enjoy learning about your program. Oh, good. So first, uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Myers. Um, Dr. Myers, uh, I know you have a lot of pictures of you doing really big open cases, but this one, I can see your eyes. And um, in fact, when we did our virtual open house last time, I don't know if you're aware, but I introduced you here and I said that you were off doing, taking, having some family time because it was the end of July. You're having some family time, uh, which is important. And I also put this picture on here because you were bedside assisting for a robotic case that the resident and the fellow were performing because you are such an outstanding teacher that you're really, this is your demonstration of progressive autonomy. So do you wanna say hello and introduce uh, the program to our applicants? Fantastic, this is actually just because I can't do robotic surgery with <laughs> anything. Um, but I've been completely eclipsed by technology and time. Um, but I do think that it illustrates uh, a great point about our program, which is one uh, that uh, we really do offer comprehensive training 
And uh, so there is very advanced robotics going on, but also uh, with myself and the oncologists, you'll really get a great experience in open surgery. And I think it's really important to have a balance of both. There's lots of places you can go that just specialize in a certain aspect of robotics, such as prostatectomy or cystectomy. And here you get really the breadth of all of your biology. Our residents graduate from here really exceptionally trained at, at many, many aspects uh, of urologic surgery. And that's something we're really, really proud of. So, you know, I'll just say our philosophy, uh, uh, and I often get asked from resident applicants, you know, what are you looking for in a resident? And there are some commonalities, but in reality, we're, we embrace kind of what residents want uh, out of training. And we have a two-part mission. You know, one part is very academic, and it's to launch careers in academics and send people to fellowships where they want to go, set them up for success uh, in academics with, you know, adequate exposure to research with, within whichever specialty they want to pursue. But the other kind of phenotype that we look for is someone that's going to be a very good clinician and someone who's going to go out into the community and be an exceptional surgeon that we're proud of and take care of great care of patients. And we really do embrace both of these uh, aspects uh, of uh, urologic training. So. We don't pigeonhole ourselves into just being an academic, very academic program or just being a clinical program. And that's in part due to our geography. We're really in a place where we need to uh, train uh, very good urologists for the Intermountain West and, and also uh, train academicians. Um, so, uh, you know, I think some unique aspects of our program that Sarah asked me to talk about was our partnership with IV Med, and maybe I'll, I'll briefly talk about that. For the last uh, five or seven years, we've had a good partnership with this organization, which offers these unparalleled sort of educational opportunities in international and global surgery. And uh, that's in, uh, a large part because the person that started IV Med, Catherine Ruiz, was a pediatric urologist uh, at University of Utah for years and years and spent most of her career here. She's still active here uh, as an adjunct professor in global surgery. And so every year, although the last two years is have been on hold, uh, uh, residents get to go uh, if they desire on a trip uh, internationally. And we've had residents that have gone to India to uh, Vietnam, among other places, and have a great experience for a week or two in global surgery. So we're constantly working towards finding these really innovative and interesting educational opportunities for residents. Resident education is a huge priority for us. It's one of the columns that our sort of uh, overall academic efforts sit upon, education, academics, and excellence in clinical care. So I'm really glad that you're all here to hear about this. And I really hope that you ask lots of questions uh, this evening. Um, I'll definitely stick on uh, here as long as uh, is appropriate. So Sarah, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, there we go. Um, so, as I mentioned to introduce myself, and then I'm gonna have Dr. Jacobson introduce her, herself. Um, I'm Sarah Lenher. I have trained and lived all over the country. I'm originally from Virginia, so I'm not from Utah. Um, I did my undergraduate um, degree in Maine and then medical school at the University of Chicago, uh, and then residency at the Leahy Clinic and fellowship at the University of Michigan. So I'm, I've been all over. Uh, I'm not originally from here, so we have a lot of people that you'll see are transplants uh, to here. Uh, and that right now I'm a reconstructive urologist where I, take, I specialize in taking care of patients with complex incontinence and neurogenic bladder. Um, and Dr. Jacobson is a pediatric urologist, and I'm going to have her 
introduce herself briefly. Hi, I'm Debbie Jacobson. I'm from Minnesota. Uh, I did my undergraduate at Princeton. I got a couple of master's degrees along the way, did my medical school at University of Pittsburgh, my residency at Vanderbilt, and then my fellowship at Northwestern, and now I'm here. And I specialize in pediatric urology and um, all the things that go along with that. I'm very, very happy to be here. We love it here. And if I'm supposed to talk more, that's my husband and my dog. She's a great dog. He's an okay husband. Sarah, I think you're muted. Sarah, you're muted. Oh, okay. Sorry, my audio bar was 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 hiding and wouldn't come back up for me. Apologies there. So, um, and I'll have Dr. Sanchez introduce himself in a couple of minutes. Um, so, Alex, have your have your intro uh, words. Um, so, our pr program interview uh, overview: we have a five-year residency program, not six, five. Uh, all urologic subspecialties in all types of practice settings are represented. So we have specialists in endourology, robotics, infertility andrology, reconstructive urology, neurourology, all the breadth and depth of oncology, pediatrics in a, in a separate hospital, microsurgery, and a very robust transgender surgery program. Um, I, we always point out that we are the only urology residency for Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, Nevada, and Montana. And um, we'll go over the research exposure opportunities, um, our high case volumes. We're very clinically busy, and we are accepting three residents for July 2022. So if those are the facts that you want to get out of this talk, there you go. Um, for our hospitals. We have um, these five hospitals that we train our residents at. There is the University Hospital, which um, over here you'll see how, how you can get to these locations in relation to the main hospital. So walking distance to the University Hospital is the University Hospital, where we train all of our residents in general urology, stones, men's health, reconstruction, and that's also where our transgender program um, is um, executed. Uh, the Huntsman Cancer Institute is a specialty cancer center. Uh, it is NCI um, certified, uh, which if you look on the map, there's not very many of those in the country and Dr. Sanchez can speak to how many there might be, um, but that covers all the breadth and depth of uh, oncologic care uh, for the Intermountain West. Um, Salt Lake City Veterans uh, Hospital is uh, right across the street from us at the, from the main hospital. And really there you get a, a lot of exposure um, and you emphasize, we emphasize a lot of independent practice um, with a cohort of patients that um, is really special. Uh, Primary Children's Hospital or uh, PCH, I apologize, it's supposed to be abbreviated PCH now, is a freestanding pediatric hospital Again, the only one in the Intermountain West and um, uh, provides uh, specialty care to uh, all those different patients. And then Intermountain Medical Center is a, a collaboration that we have with a private practice group that is in the Valley here. Uh, there are different hospitals that our residents um, go to and operate at with different private, private practice providers, urologists, and they get a lot of exposure to different types of um, urologic care in a private practice setting. So if, as you all are going through all these different programs, think about all the breadth and depth of these different types of offerings that different programs have, because you might decide, hey, I want a county hospital. We don't actually have a county hospital here, but we have a VA, or you might decide, I don't want to provide care for veterans. And so maybe avoid those programs. So just look at what different types of uh, hospitals uh, training programs are going to be um, offering for you. Our residents, as you can see here, um, uh, this is a sample of what our residents are doing for this current year for 2021-2022. <coughs> it kind of fluctuates every year right now because our resident complement is either two or three residents, but we're expanding to always be three residents going forward. 
Um, most notably, I'll point out for you that we have you do six months of urology during your intern year, and then two months of ICU care, and then four additional months on the general surgery services. Um, these change a little bit every single year, especially as different uh, numbers of residents uh, come up through the system, but you can see that a lot of um, independence and, and supervision uh, is offered at the VA, and you get a, um, a large variety of pediatric and oncology um, training in addition to the university service. One of the things that I want to emphasize by us introducing ourselves, um, and Dr. Myers didn't talk too much about where he trained, but he's also trained all over the country, um, is that we as a faculty had trained um, many different places and likely a lot of those top programs that you all are, are applying to. Um, you can see them represented here uh, on, this, on this map of the country. Um, and, and, but we all decided that this was home for us where we wanted to teach the ne next generation of urologists. And when you overlay our fellowships, uh, this is what you add in a lot of those specialty fellowship programs uh, that um, you really need to go uh, Boston Children's, CHOPs, um, Sick Kids, uh, they're, they're all represented here and Memorial Sloan Kettering, these different types of specialty locations for um, care, for fellowship training. One of the things that Dr. Myers mentioned briefly is that our patient population is quite large. We have a referral area uh, called the Intermountain West, which I didn't know anything uh, about until I moved here. Um, it a, it's a, covers the five surrounding states um, in a referral area that's about 10% of the continental United States. Um, and I'll have Dr. Sanchez speak uh, in a moment about the diversity of this patient population and, and how we try to, um, to reach uh, these different patients. Um, for example, you can say that you know, we have all the socioeconomic levels that we take care of, the ranchers in Wyoming, the Silicon Slopes tech workers that might get a kidney stone, uh, the Native American populations and immigrants. So um, you can see that this area is quite large and um, uh, is a, a very rich uh, training ground for our residents to see a lot of different um, types of patients and pathologies. Dr. Sanchez, do you wanna talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing um, on the diversity, equity, and uh, inclusion aspect of things. Sure. I'd and introduce to... yourself, please. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm I'm Alejandro Sanchez. I go by Alex. Um, so I've been here for two years. Uh, so this is the start of my my third year. Started around the same time as Dr. Jacobson. Um, and uh, so I'm originally from Colombia. I grew up in South Florida and did all of my training in the Northeast. Um, so I spent uh, about 10 years in Boston. I was in New York City for fellowship um, and then decided to kind of be very open-minded about where I would end up for my first faculty position, kind of thinking about, um, you know, good opportunities, support, patient population, and being somewhere that uh, we could be close to the outdoors and really um, Utah and the University of Utah checked uh, a lot of those boxes. So we've been very happy here as a family and certainly have enjoyed my experience so far. Um, so I just want to talk quickly about, you know, something that I think is a urology community we've been we've been discussing uh, a little bit more in the open. Um, there was a recent um, set of articles in AUA News that kind of discussed um, sort of some of the facts around the lack of diversity, um, equity, and inclusion within the field of urology. And I think coming together around a, a certain set of facts, knowing that, you know, the population in the United States is diversifying and we have a shortage of um, uh, minority physicians, uh, female physicians, and when you start to zero in on the different specialties, especially uh, surgical subspecialties, you see that that um, disparity exists uh, even more. So this is just a summary of, um, you know, our goals are to try to address this problem um, of diversity in urology in our own way, and that's really by improving uh, 
residency and faculty diversity through different uh, methods that I'll go through um, and really expanding our pipeline for uh, future trainees. And that starts way earlier than just, just residency. So as you can see here, most of the rates from the urology census um, a female urologists, African American, Black, uh, Hispanic urologists have really not not really increased that much um, over the last several years, and this this trend is pretty um, has been pretty stable over the last you know five years or so. Um, can we go to the yep, next? Yep, you ready? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, one of one of the purposes of, of discussing um, this with you and and we're, we have actually a, a kind of a town hall meeting with uh, with applicants of all surgical specialties October 13th that you're all invited to and I'll share a little slide that gives the details. But is to show that you know Utah, um, just like other uh, states in the Mountain West, are diversifying. So about 15 percent or so. What does this say? 13 percent of the population here is uh, Hispanic, and that's all of Utah. If you look at Salt Lake City itself, it's about 20 percent. Not uncommon for me to spend you know a morning speaking a lot of Spanish in my clinic. Um, I feel like patients definitely um, you know seek out. Um, uh, patients that speak their their primary language, so it's it's been actually part of an exciting um, uh, more of a surprise here in Utah than I would have even imagined, given you know my experiences in Boston and New York, where it's a little bit more diverse, but you don't necessarily see that patient population in the hospitals that you work. Um, and there are other uh, unique populations here, like Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, and there's a lot of research going on how to help you know, that specific patient population with um, some unique cancers and, and other things. Um, and, and I think Sarah, uh, Dr. Lenher mentioned, you know, the huge catch in the area that we have, and that leads to also a very interesting um, patient population to deal with, patients that, you know, really don't have a physician for hours and hours and don't have much support from a um, from a general urologist or even primary care physician, a lot of low health literacy in, in patients from uh, rural backgrounds. So um, you're still dealing with a lot of disparities that, um, that we need a, a lot of help with. Um, Kate, next slide. And so uh, here at the University of Utah, um, we've set up an, an EDI um, group and that has a representative from every surgical subspecialty. So this is a top priority for the uh, Department of Surgery as a whole and the Chief of, of Surgery in the University of Utah. Um, there are different pipeline programs uh, which are starting from high school to get uh, students uh, really interested in medicine in general and then going up to um, you know, medical students for us in the division of urology, as well as ENT, we've set up scholarships to try to get medical students to come rotate with us and get to know us um, and help, uh, you know, fill in some of the gaps with uh, potential financial um, uh, assistance needed. Um, and we're trying to overhaul how we do our application process to really minimize bias and try to take a more holistic approach to how we select, pay, how we select um, uh, residents for uh, interviews as well as uh, ranking them. And next slide. And this is just the last slide. If you are interested and want to learn a little bit more about um, kind of the EDI, EDI efforts going on within the whole department of surgery, we have a meeting October 13th. You're all invited to come. Um, and I think uh, this just shows, you know, how um, involved in, in the type of investment that the Department of Surgery has for increasing diversity in the faculty and the residents uh, here at the University of Utah. So that's it. I'll share this slide again later and um, I, it's out on Twitter also. So uh, hopefully you all can find that. Thank you, Alex. So one of the other things that's kind of come up in, in trying to identify how we can be more inclusive of all applicants and residents uh, in our program is to um, think solidly about a residency parental leave policy. And, and we are, are implementing this um, 
uh, in our program uh, to really accommodate the needs for residents during and after pregnancy or following childbirth, adoption, or surrogacy. Um, because we want all people, all applicants, to be able to be urologists and not have a restriction based off of the desire to have a family um, during the, your peak childbearing year, years. Um, so we have a formalized plan uh, that's established for limited call responsibilities uh, during pregnancy, uh, modified rotation schedule, and then um, leave components, including parental leave, disability leave, and vacation time uh, that uh, gives you the maximum amount of time to be off, uh, but still not have to make up additional time uh, unless you want to take additional time, but not have to make up additional time for being absent from your residency training. Um, so if anyone would like additional details about how that might be um, uh, rolled out in your particular case, we're happy to provide additional information on that. Over the years, as we've been doing these, um, these talks, um, we have, uh, We've had uh, questions about resident autonomy. And the, the main thing that we're very well known for is uh, training very good surgeons that are able to go out and, and manage complex um, issues in the Intermountain West. Uh, it's really a graded autonomy type program and the residents do an excellent job at pulling each other up through the system uh, and helping each other learn along the way. Intern year, you really get your feet wet in managing patients, operating, finding where things are. Um, and um, we also expose you to all the different uh, surgical urology sites. So then when you go and you have to take call at like the primary, um, the children's hospital, you are accustomed to how to answer those uh, patient phone calls overnight, the mommy calls as they're called, uh, and things like that. Um, as you progress, you'll gain additional responsibility. And even starting as your third year resident, you become the chief of certain services. Um, so you'll start to manage the service, make the inpatient decisions, take junior residents through cases on call and, um, and really get uh, into the breadth and depth of all urology um, fields. Uh, every attending that we have really has a different style. Some of them will be more focused on teaching you the finer points of the procedure, um, while others will be in tune with granting you more autonomy and, um, and not necessarily making sure you drew that stitch exactly the same way that they would, uh, but they wanna keep you safe. So overall, over the last two, probably 10 years or so, two thirds of our, of our residents go on to additional fellowship training um, but about a third go into uh, direct clinical practice. And um, we have these people all over the country. Um, so you may have seen some of them at your, at your institutions that you're at right now. The other thing um, that we get asked is, is how are the, the urology fellows um, integrated into the workflow and um, and the clinical learning uh, on our, on our, um, in our division. And so um, we currently have five uh, urology fellows. Uh, we'll have six fellows as of July, 2022. Um, this includes one pediatric fellow at Primary Children's, um, one male infertility andrology clinical fellow uh, uh, for one year. There are two reconstructive fellows. One is uh, clinical and one is research-based but has some clinical um, interactions. Then there's an oncology fellowship that just started this past year, um, which is one year long. And then we're actually trying something new, which, which I think is a, a different balance with the um, residents is a general urology medical fellowship. So these are non-surgical trained urologists that, are, that we are training to do treat patients in the clinical practice only and just do office-based procedures, but not be surgeons um, because there is a very large need in urology and, um, and we have the training capacity to be able to offer that. Um, and this fellow will be working with the residents and helping take call with them um, and working in parallel with them. I put these pictures down here because um, 
one thing that comes up often is, is what are the fellows like and what's the relationship like? And our fellows are pretty incredible. I, I'm very impressed when I meet the fellows and onboard them and introduce them to our residency program. They're quite compassionate. They recognize what the struggles are as being a, a resident and they wanna integrate in and be true team players. So this is uh, Suzanne, one of our chief residents now. Um, this was, uh, I guess, two years ago with our pediatrics fellow, um, Neha, and they, you know, they really become part of our, the resident, the fellows become part of our team um, and uh, integrate in very nicely with our residents and our residents appreciate them as friends and colleagues. Another aspect that comes up that's uh, unique about our program are the research opportunities. We have national leaders on our faculty in multiple research consortiums. So I've got pictures here for TURNS, which is the Trauma and Urologic Reconstructive uh, Network of Surgeons. Um, and then Enbridge, which is the Neurogenic Bladder Research Group. Um, both of these were founded uh, by Dr. Myers and others. Um, we have um, lots of, uh, funding through all of these other uh, different uh, institutions at the NIH, PCORI, CDC, and then the Department of Defense. Um, we, and we have funded research in every subspecialty. We're also, uh, Dr. Hotelian, one of our um, men's health andrologists is uh, in charge of SPARC, which is the Surgical Population Analysis Research Corps. It's a health services research-based um, research core. Uh, where we use a lot of large databases, including the Utah Population Database uh, and market scan data to uh, analyze surgical um, issues using health services um, research premises. Um, we also have paid fellowships for reconstructive urology, men's health, and oncology. So these are applicants that are uh, prior to their uh, residency, if they choose to apply to residency, they maybe want to take some time after medical school generally um, and join us for research. And these uh, research fellows are really great at partnering with our residents uh, to help do some of the work uh, for some clinical questions. Um, but then they are, um, but then our residents are looking at the clinical aspects of um, these, these questions that the fellows are working on. Um, and then um, we do have a financial incentive for publishing papers um, at the resident level. And then most importantly, down here in the bottom, I have Elizabeth, who is not only our, our residency pro, um, pro, program coordinator, so you'll interact with her for all of your residency uh, application questions. Um, when you get that extra letter of recommendation that you wanna send along, it goes to Elizabeth. Um, but also she's our research coordinator and, and coordinates all these different research projects for us. Uh, so it's, it's, she's an invaluable um, shining light that I have down here in the corner. Uh, so shout out to Elizabeth. Dr. Myers mentioned a, a, um, our IVU med um, uh, relationship and he uh, spoke to our, our uh, Catherine DeVries is uh, the founder of IVU med. The motto for IVU Med is um, teach one, reach many. Uh, and typically uh, every year one resident goes, um, of course this has been curtailed in the pandemic, um, but we have a strong commitment to providing this opportunity. And Dr. Myers mentioned the scholarships uh, available. So we, we hope that once we can travel freely throughout the world, uh, we will be doing these uh, again shortly. This is Austin Slade. He was uh, he graduated last year uh, when he was in um, Vietnam uh, on his on his trip. So he provided these these pictures. He was our last resident to go out on a trip um, before the pandemic. And we had one cancel uh, that was already planned. Um, next up, I have uh, some comments about uh, culture. Um, we we do a, we do a lot, and and the uh, the the, the motto around here is work hard, play hard. Uh, this is Pat Cartwright. He's our former um, chief of urology and he's currently the chief of surgery at Primary Children's, I believe is his official title. Um, and uh, he's, he's out uh, skiing and noticing he has some deep snow on his hands. Uh, this picture up here is uh, Andrew Mazzoni uh, in the shades. Um, uh, and they, he was out, he's one of our chief residents who you'll meet in a few with um, 
Chris Deckett here is one of our uh, oncologists um, out on a ride. I don't recall if they were doing a race. They must have because they've got some medals around their uh, neck. And this is Jeff Redshaw. Redshaw, he's practicing in Montana now. Um, and uh, so these are some other goofy pictures that have come up over the years. Um, and then uh, one funny thing that happened last Friday, uh, the residents had some a complex foley that needed to be taken care of on the floor. And Dr. Hamilton was starting a case on his own. He's one of our endourologists. And, um, and the residents were going to go and take care of the, the, the patient that was that they couldn't, nobody else could get a catheter into. And I was like, I'll go scrub it with Dr. Hamilton. I'll assist him. So I went up to the, the OR and I showed up and he looks at me, he's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm your assistant. And so the residents quickly ran to the floor and took care of the, the patient. And then they ran to the OR to be able to get a picture of us because they couldn't believe that I was going to scrub in with, with Dr. Hamilton. And, and basically I, I was kind of like, is this how you do it? Is this, so I kind of, he, he was more than happy to have one of the residents come in and join him for the second, si second kidney because I just did one side with him. So anyhow, we try to have fun and uh, um, uh, entertain the residents maybe a little bit. Um, finally, uh, we have a lot of resident wellness activities that we've been rolling out over the years um, because we recognize that we want you all to be whole people at the end of your residency and not just amazing surgeons. Um, again, with the pandemic, some of these things have changed uh, their format slightly. Uh, this uh, upper left-hand corner is um, uh, the ladies brunch that we do every year. So we, we did this outside and there we all are in our masks um, last, uh, last spring. Um, uh, axe throwing was uh, before the pandemic and an escape room was before the pandemic. Uh, but this was the pool party over the, over the summer. So you can still go outside and hang out in August in Dr. Hamilton's pool uh, in the middle of a pandemic. So we have lots of activities. We have a resident wellness champion, um, Matt Swallow. He's one of our third years. He has a pottery throwing uh, class that's organized. I don't know exactly when it's happening, but I think it's in the next month or so. Uh, we got funding for it and uh, they're going to learn how to throw some pots. So we'll, we'll have a competition and grade them later, I think. Um, one of the one of the aspects that uh, Dr. Jacobson encountered when she came to the to the uh, Salt Lake Valley, she said, "What am I supposed to do around here? Where am I supposed to eat? Where am I supposed to go for a ride? Whatever." And so she started collecting this information. It was so comprehensive uh, that um, this urology work hard play hard link on the uh, university website uh, was actually developed by us and the the whole. Um, uh, all the GME programs uh, took it over uh, to use as uh, their own standing um, reference for where to go for different types of activities. Uh, and so I can't go over everything to do in Salt Lake, but there's plenty. And uh, Dr. Jacobson had taken it on to herself to, uh, to collect all this information. And now you can enjoy it when you do get to come and visit. We have a uh, a presence on Instagram and Twitter. Um, I personally have a hard time keeping up, um, but I, I think that it kind of ebbs and flows. I don't, I, I don't know, maybe in a year or two, people will be like, oh, that was so two, 2020, I don't know. Um, but uh, we, we definitely try to, try to keep up our, our social media presence. Uh, but um, if, we, if we lack sometimes on that, it's just that we're we're too busy, uh, you know, taking care of patients and then going outside where we don't have cell phone reception. So um, another question that comes up a lot is uh, where do the residents live? So this is uh, the easiest way to really show you is this is a map of, um, this is a map of uh, Salt Lake City uh, proper next to the Wasatch Front, which is all this green space. Um, the main hospital is up here at the top. Um, if I tried to use the pen, I would probably mess it up. Let's see if I can do it. I think I did it. Yep. So, yep, there it is. Main hospital and the VA are right there. 
Um, and then I've marked out where a bunch of our residents live. Uh, they always comment to me that Mitch lives over here. Uh, so I need to kind of add Mitch on here. Um, but the point of this is that uh, this is the, um, the canyon, Parley's Canyon going up to Park City. So basically Park City is right up here. And then Big Cottonwood Canyon and Little Cottonwood Canyon are all down here. Uh, so you have very close access to the, to the mountains, to the canyons, uh, and then you can live right here in the thick of things. Um, so very close access for our residents. You're not gonna spend time finding parking and getting tickets. And we actually have resident, resident parking spaces here at the university for two of our residents each on rotation. Um, so there's lots of access there. And then, uh, like I mentioned, for our residents, we um, are, sorry, our faculty, our residents likewise have come from all over the country. Uh, and so this is a representation of, of where they come from. Um, our residents are really important to us and we value each of them individually um, so much that I'm gonna show you who all of them are. So these are our interns. Uh, this is Colton. He came over from uh, Colorado, from the University of Colorado. This is Miko, uh, he came from the University of Wisconsin. And this is Erin, she came from Boston University. And we have a res an intern brunch uh, in my backyard every year uh, and they go for a hike out in the foothills out of my backyard. So this was my little sign that I made for them using my children's chalkboard. Um, next up are our second years, Soren and Zach. Uh, Soren came, um, he was our research fellow for men's health and reconstructive urology for three years uh, and trained for his medical degree in Iran. Um, and then Zach Pfeiffer uh, came over also from the University of Colorado. Um, our third years uh, are Dr. Sharon Lowe here in the middle. She uh, provides our humid uh, diversity here. She came from the University of Florida at Gainesville. Um, and uh, I think she's the one from the farthest south. But um, and then Laurel Mast uh, came from OHSU and Matt Swallow came from Yale. And these are some pictures that they have submitted over the years. Uh, our PGY4s are Mitch Heiner uh, here with his wife and little girl. Uh, and then Chris Martin uh, um, came from the University of Texas at Houston. And Mitch came from um, the Mayo Clinic for residents for medical school. And then finally, our chief residents, Dr. Basilius, who is our only University of Utah uh, graduate right now for, from medical school. Uh, Suzanne Lang here in the middle, she came from uh, Indiana University. Uh, and then Andrew Mazzoni came from Rush. And so these are some more pictures of them. So I know we've gone a little bit long because I want you to be able to talk to the residents, but. Thank you so much for joining us. We really want to get to know you all better. Um, we, we truly do conduct a holistic review of every element of your application. Um, so we're reading all of that information that you put in there. If you wrote it really long, we're gonna read all of it. Um, but we really want to have uh, read these applications to help us build the best team. And you guys are all gonna be exceptional urologists. Um, you just need to focus on finding the right team for you and uh, have fun with the process. So thank you so much for joining us on this Monday evening. And um, I will post this uh, uh, EDI slide again, but again, it's out on Twitter. Um, so you can uh, reach that information. And um, uh, hopefully if that interests you or you want to hear more from the Department of Surgery uh, and all of us will also be there for breakout rooms. Uh, please plan on coming to join us. So did I miss anything? No, there were a couple questions in the chat. Perfect, um, excellent. One of the questions was, how are the relationships between our urology team and the respective hospital administrations? Dr. Myers, you wanna to speak to the administration? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think administration takes care of one function and, and clinical care takes care of another. Um, I would say that we're a growing system and that, that's an exciting uh, place to be. And the reason that we're a growing system is there's a lot of energy here 
and Utah is a growing place. And so uh, University of Utah takes over more and more of the market share of Utahns as far as insurance and care, and also the population is growing so much. And so it's great to be in a place where there's a lot of energy and, uh, and administration is a big part of that. Uh, University of Utah has been in the top 10 uh, academic universities uh, in the country, and it's a museum full, which uh, it's very important to these universities. And that's out of 120 academic universities uh, in the country. And so it is a great place to work. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the administration. Any other questions that weren't answered in the chat, um, Debbie? I think other than I think there's a knitting club versus pottery club for me. <laughs> um, we have been asked about uh, time for trauma and reconstruction. I think Dr. Myers wrote back in the chat a little bit more about that. Um, I think that's it for the chat I'm, question. I'm kind of biased, but I can tell you that the reconstructive exposure here is, is quite amazing. Um, Sarah will tell you we care for about 3,000 people with spinal cord injury uh, in the Mountain West through our rehabilitation hospital. And so, you know, I was kind of shocked. I talked to one of the fellows the other day who said they had never seen an augmentation system class. And, uh, you know, I mean, we do about 20 a year here or more. And so you, you really do see a lot of reconstruction trauma and also a transgender program. We're now doing 1.5 days of uh, surgery a week in the program. Then McCormick has just come on and half of his practice is gonna do gender affirmation surgery. So there's a lot of exposure to uh, reconstruction. I think it's, from my perspective, one of the real positives among many, many positives uh, with the surgical training here. And I'll say from a resident's perspective, I think we had excellent training for that and excellent exposure from like, I'm gonna, I'm planning to go into urologic oncology, but I think that like having the recon part of it will be like, I'll take that into my oncologic practices. And I think it's been very meaningful in that. So it's been good. We actually have a memory erase for all that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, uh, Debbie, Suzanne, how many, how many residents do we have? I see Mitch, I see Suzanne. I see Jake. Three. So three, That's three resident. Right. Okay. I just want to assign three rooms and I'm going to, you guys talk about any additional questions so I can get everybody moved to a different room. And then- Could I uh, be a part of a uh, join a room? I am taking care of some, uh kids right at bedtime right now so Ooh, i can pop in yes. in a second all right yes i will give you guys <laughs> okay hold on okay and any other questions you guys have there yeah how does jake get his kids to go to bed at 7 23 p.m it's even dark out yeah, I want to know no, it's, mine it's, still aren't going it's for getting it's, it's the getting ready for bed that takes forever. Oh. Okay, I was like, I need to hear your tricks. We all do. Almost I'd like to go to bed at seven thirty too. My problem is, I go and I fall asleep in one of my kids' rooms at that hour, and then and then I can't get up and do anything. Okay, I've got you guys going to two rooms, uh, Jake and. Suzanne, you guys are in the same room. Mitch, you're in the other room. Um, and you guys are whooshed away. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. And please don't feel obligated to stay any longer. Uh, you know, feel free to, to um, dismiss yourself. And uh, we're just so glad to have had the opportunity for you to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Tanner, did I not assign you? He might be busy. Well, maybe I'm sorry about that. I, I'm Don't helping worry, kids with, with feeding and stuff, but I'm hopping in. Okay, okay, cool. I just was making sure I hadn't forgotten about you. Enjoy. Good, good. Thank you. Get your kids to bed too. <laughs> <laughs> well. Okay, cool. Uh, let me hit, let me stop recording.